God, we pray that you'd open up our ears this morning, that we would hear the truth, and that it would sink down deep into our hearts, that it would be deeply planted, and that it would grow into something beautiful. Show us this morning how to be thankful, Father, for the amazing gifts that you have given us. Open our ears and open Bob's mouth as he speaks the word in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, good morning, everyone. Oh, it's green now. <laughs> anyways, there you go. All right, so anyway, since I'm, uh, I'm thinking that most of you heard what I just said because of my, I, I don't have an inside voice. Uh, I, I, I think, uh, so I, 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 I was in Brazil and I got home Monday evening and tomorrow evening I leave for Seoul and Beijing. So just pray that God will give me the, uh, the, um, the passion and vigor of a 30-year-old instead of a 63-year-old. Uh, so anyways, uh, the Lord can do that. It's always good to be back. Thank you to the Vandertils. Well, let's, let's uh, honor them this morning. You guys were awesome. Uh, leading us, uh, great stuff, guys, and I uh, appreciate very much your ministry of music this morning. It helps prepare our hearts for God's Word. Uh, it's Thanksgiving, and I want you to do something uh, right now. I want just, how many of you are having your Thanksgiving dinner today? Okay, for those of you who are, okay, I want you to just close your eyes for a second. Breathe deep, smell the turkey, <laughs> the pumpkin pie, okay, open your eyes, and forget about it for about half an hour, all right, because otherwise, you're not going to hear a thing I say, because there's, there's turkey cooking at home, and I want you to make sure, I, I want to make sure I got your attention right here. Every family has traditions on Thanksgiving, don't we? And ours is to go around the table, and everyone has to say something for which they're thankful, I read an autobiography years ago by actress Helen Hayes, and she tells of the first time she ever cooked a turkey on Thanksgiving for her husband and little boy. And she said this at the beginning of the day, I'm going to try my hand at cooking a turkey for the very first time. If it doesn't work out, she said, we will just go, don't say a word, we will just leave, get in the car, and go find a place to have turkey dinner. Later that day, she calls her husband and child to the table, goes into the kitchen, prepares the food to bring it out, and as she brings out the, the food, there sitting at the table is her husband and her little boy in their coat and their hat and the car keys in his hand. <laughs> I love Thanksgiving traditions, and we love our Thanksgiving dinners, and we're so grateful, I'm so grateful, I'm sure we all are, to live where we live. Uh, I know it's been a tough uh, fall for farmers. Usually by now the beans are in and the, the wheat's up a little bit. And, but I was driving down Bear Line yesterday over in Dover, and, and the, the beets are all in huge big walls, as they always are, along the road. And So I know some things are happening in the fields, and some of the farmers are getting in their fields this, this fall. And We're just so blessed to live where we live and to see the hand of the Lord in, the, in just the, uh, the produce that comes out of the fields of uh, Chatham-Kent. And uh, I wouldn't live anywhere else in the world. I've told you that before, and I'll keep telling you that. Uh, we love it here. Uh, Christians are people of thanksgiving. We always have been. In, in the year 125 AD, a Greek by the name of Arist Aristides uh, was writing in a letter to a friend of his about these followers of this God named Jesus. And he wrote this. If any righteous man among the Christians passes from this world, they rejoice and offer thanks to God. And they escort his body with songs of thanksgiving, as if he were setting out for some place nearby. Isn't that beautiful? I love that description of us Christians. I've done funerals since 1981 when I began ministry, and, 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 and Christian funerals are different than non-Christian funerals. I, I did a non-Christian funeral one time for a friend of mine. We were visiting in a city, and he was on holidays, and he happened to know that we were there. It was kind of odd. And, and he calls me from Florida or somewhere, and he says, I'm out of town. This lady in the church has passed away. She's a young woman. Would you do the funeral? I didn't know her from Adam's house cat. 
So, but I said, sure, I'll do the funeral. So anyways, the mother, who was not a Christian, never ha happened before or since, the casket's lying there. She literally flings herself on the casket and begins to wail. And I turn to the funeral director and I go, help. <laughs> we, that's never happened at a Christian funeral. Because we are, by nature, people of thanksgiving. Even in the most challenging times of our lives, when we've lost someone close to us, and we all have, there's always that hope and that sense of thanksgiving to God for who our brother or sister was. And so I want to look this morning at a few things about thanksgiving. You're not going to have any deep theology, and you probably won't learn a lot of new stuff. It's Thanksgiving after all. And if we don't know a lot about giving thanks as God's people now, I guess we'll never learn it. But I want to just review, first of all, the call of God to his children to be men and women of thanksgiving. And it begins way back in the Old Testament. Before we get there, let me give you a little bit of history of our Thanksgiving celebrations in this country. They're actually tied more to European than than American traditions. In fact, you may be surprised to learn that the first official Thanksgiving celebration that ever took place in North America was not the pilgrims, but in fact was something that happened decades before that, 43 years before the first Thanksgiving took place in Plymouth, Massachusetts. In 1578 in Canada, Martin Frobisher, an explorer from England, who was in search of the Northwest Passage, stopped and told his crew that they were going to stop and have a Thanksgiving celebration for God bringing them to this new land. I don't know why as Canadians we don't hear that story 43 years before the pilgrims. We know all about the pilgrims. We don't know a lot about Martin Frobisher. For a hundred years, Thanksgiving was celebrated in our country, either in late October or early November. It was declared a national holiday in 1879. And it was then that November 6th was set aside as the official Thanksgiving holiday. All of that was fine until November 11th rolled around in the year 1911, and Canadian Thanksgiving ended up being five days before Remembrance Day. And it got lost in the shuffle of, as it ought to be, the priority of remembering those who have died for our freedom. So in 1957, Canadian Parliament announced that it would always be the second Monday of October. And it was proclaimed this, and this is the law in Canada, a day of general thanksgiving to Almighty God for the bountiful harvest with which Canada has been blessed. Praise God. That that's an answer, that's an act of parliament, that we are called to thank Almighty God for the bountiful harvest, and has been the second Monday in October ever since. Well, that's the Canadian tradition. What's the Christian tradition? Well, it goes way back to 1 Chronicles 16, 7 to 9. So let me paint the picture. You will recall, if you know your, your Jewish history, that the Ark of the Covenant was, was stolen during battle by the Philistines. And eventually, God's people, the Jews, got it back. But it wasn't until David became king and established the city of David outside of Jerusalem, prepared his place there, and then prepared a, a, a place in Jerusalem for the ark, that the ark was brought back. So here's what's happening in, in, this, in this scripture we're going to look at. For a long time, the ark has not been where it belonged. It was a curious jerum and had been settled there by King David until he could bring it to Jerusalem. You will know that there was no temple yet. David was not allowed to build the temple because he was a man of war, so God told him that his son Solomon would build the temple. So this is David's time. The temple has not been built, but the ark represented the presence of God. And so God hadn't been at the heart of his people for a long time. And now, now God had prepared his presence to return. Now, if you know anything about history, one of the, I, I watch YouTube historical stuff. And one of the things that I love watching, and I never get tired of it, is when the Canadian troops at the end of the Second World War 
came into Holland and freed the Netherlands. And if you watch that happen, you will see the joy, the joy, the absolute and unrestrained joy on the heart of the Dutch people that after five years, freedom had come to their nation. You got to watch it sometime. The, the, just the incredible joy on the hearts of the people. I would guess there may be some of you here this morning who remember that happening. Just guessing, there might be one or two who remember. I, I knew that. I absolutely knew that. I didn't want to point you out, but your, you know, your kids did, so you're in trouble. <laughs> you were there at the time, weren't you? And know that joy of seeing those Canadians come. It's unbelievable. Well, if that's the case, that kind of a modern picture of the presence of Almighty God coming back into Jerusalem, can you imagine? Can you imagine God? The, the, the covenant God of his people who had called them and had told them that he would never leave them or forsake them has returned now. Oh, welcome back. Hardly. And so David proclaims a thanksgiving proclamation. It says in 1 Corinthians 16, 7 and 9, At that time, David began the custom of using choirs in the tabernacle to sing thanksgiving to the Lord. Asaph was the director of this choral group of priests. Oh, give thanks to the Lord and pray to him they sang. Tell the peoples of the world about his mighty doings. Sing to him, yes, sing his praises and tell of his marvelous works. God was returning to his people. And the proclamation was to sing songs of praise and to glorify the Lord who had returned to his proper place amongst his people. Well, it was never God's desire to ever leave his people. And all of what was happening in this time was God's plan working out to permanently take up residence within the hearts and lives of his people. And so if, if this is the story from First Chronicles, we need to come now to the New Testament, to Second Chronicles 9, verse 15, which says, Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. I have been in some pretty remote places during the Christmas season. I was in the middle of Myanmar, Burma. It was about three weeks before Christmas. It was early December. And we are worshiping at, at a little tiny church building, two and a half days drive from the capital city of Myanmar. It was really, really, really remote in the middle of the jungle, a little church building three weeks before Christmas. They knew this Canadian guy was going to be there. So I'm looking forward to good Myanmar worship, Christian worship. Let's see what it's going to be like, a little taste of heaven. And the worship team begins, and I hear the, 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 the familiar chords of silent night, holy night. I'm thinking, wow, wow. I'm in the jungle. It's like 48 degrees Celsius out. We're, we're sweating like pigs. And we're singing Silent Night. I'm thinking, holy cow, this is amazing. What a world. We are naturally people of song. Because as 2 Corinthians 9.15 says, we have received this indescribable gift. The creator God of the universe who stepped into our world at Christmas. No wonder the world loves Christmas. In every nation of the world, in pagan nations, in Buddhist nations, in Muslim nations, they still celebrate Christmas. It boggles my mind. Why? Because innately they know that this indescribable gift, whom they might not even know, has stepped into this world. If that's why we love Christmas, it's why we as God's people particularly love Pentecost. 
Because the God who stepped back into Jerusalem in an ark, who stepped into our world in a manger in Bethlehem, has decided to take up residence in our hearts. You are a temple of the Holy Ghost. Thanks be to God. Now, please tell me if you can describe that. Because Paul couldn't call it indescribable. I can't. In fact, I was thinking about it in my devotional time the other day, and I broke. I just absolutely broke. I began to weep, actually, when I was considering the impact and the incredible mystery of the fact that the God who said, let there be light, lives here. I can't describe that. Can you? Paul couldn't. God has taken up residence in the body, literally the body, of every single one of those whose hearts and lives have been redeemed by Jesus Christ. I can't describe that. I can't put that into words. My finite mind will never get around the fact that when I walk out of this building and get in my car and with my mother we drive back to Chatham, the Spirit of God this creator of God, the spirit who hovered over the, the void in Genesis chapter 1 is now here? I don't get it. I too often forget it. But when I do ponder it, the only response I can think of is thanksgiving. No wonder we're called to be people of thanksgiving. Thanks be to God. I can't describe it. But I am so incredibly grateful for it. If we have nothing else for which to thank God this morning, that would be enough. Wouldn't it? Wouldn't that be enough? I don't get it. But that's what the Bible teaches. But there is more. <laughs> because James, the half-brother of Jesus, our Lord, wrote this in James 1.17. For every good and perfect gift comes, from, comes down from the Father of lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. Wow. So that's the beginning. His presence in us is just the beginning. Then he says every perfect, good and perfect gift comes down from above. I've got to stop here. Because on this Thanksgiving weekend, if you've never received that indescribable gift, you're missing the most incredible experience of your life. Jesus loves you so much. And Bethlehem happened because he loves you. Because within the heart of everyone who's never come to know Christ, there is an emptiness that is just his size. And you long for that and you know it. And you can receive all the other gifts and express thanksgiving for all the other gifts that we have as Canadians living in a very prosperous nation, in a very prosperous municipality. You, we can be grateful to the Lord for all of those gifts, but if you've not received the gift of eternal life, you're missing the indescribable gift of Christ in you. He came to die for you to take upon himself on the cross the punishment that we all deserve. Our God is a just God. And he can't ignore sin. But he doesn't want you to live in your sin and die in your sin. He wants to take it from you. And so he placed it on Jesus on the cross. And if you will just ask him for forgiveness and trust him, he will lift that sin and remove it and he will give you the gift of himself and the gift of eternal life. That's the indescribable gift that Paul is talking about. And it's yours for the asking this morning. And don't go through one more Thanksgiving Sunday without receiving that gift by asking the Lord Jesus to, to, to take away your sin and invite him into your heart and life to be your Savior. The Savior of the world will take up residence in you. You will understand that. You will find it indescribable. And it will change your life and it will change your eternity. Don't leave this place this morning without putting your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. That's the greatest gift. And you think you're thankful now? <laughs> just, just ask him to come in and you'll understand.
So the call is for God's people to be people of thanksgiving. And the question is, why? So let's talk about that a little bit. Uh, I love the fact that our post office receives 1.5 million letters every Christmas addressed to Santa Claus, North Pole, H-O-H-O-H-O. Right here. So, look at the postal code. This is not, this is the truth, by the way. There really is a postal code. H-0-H-0-H-0. If you read it, it says, ho, ho, ho. (laughs) They receive 1.5 million letters a year from Canadian kids to Santa Claus at the North Pole, ho, ho, ho. That's great. You want to know what's astounding? Every one of those letters gets an answer. You want to also know what's astounding? Last year after Christmas, one child wrote back to say thank you. 1.5 million letters, 1.5 million responses, and one thank you letter. We got a Thanksgiving problem in this country. As we go through Scripture, and I want to just run through a bunch of them this morning, we're reminded of all that we're called to be thankful for. Take time to show your thankfulness. So let's run through some Scriptures here. They're going to be put in front of us. The first one is Psalm 7, verse 17. I will give thanks to the Lord because of His righteousness and will sing praise to the name of the Lord Most High. So we have this indescribable gift, the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives, who is Christ in me, the hope of glory, the implication of that is every other good and perfect gift. So what are they? Well, we're going to list them. The one here is because the Lord's righteousness. When when the Lord looks at us, he doesn't see us, thank the Lord. He sees Jesus in us, and he is our righteousness. So we can stand before a holy God. We can come in prayer anywhere, everywhere, all the time, every day, every moment, in the the midst of this righteous and holy God, His righteousness has been planted in me, so He says to me, I don't see you, I see Jesus, come on in. And everyone said, thank you, Lord. Let's say it. Thank you, Lord. Let's go to the next one. Uh, Which should be coming along any second now. There it is. Psalm 75, verse 1. We give thanks to you, O God. We give thanks for your name is near. Men tell of your wonderful deeds. The Lord is close by. Now, this is the the mystery, the indescribable part. He takes up residence in our lives, but he's also nearby. He, He lives in us and does stuff around us. He lives in us and does stuff in us. He's a God who's who's active. There were deists in the old days. Deists believed that that, that God created the world. There is a God. He created the world. He wound the thing up like an old uh, grandfather's clock and let it run down. And then he went off and did other things. That's not the God of the Bible. The God of the Bible is near. The God of the Bible does things. He's intimately, intimately interested in our lives And he comes near to take part in our lives and to do stuff in us when we need him to. And God, we're going to complete, complete, thank you, Lord, again, all to do this. So let's try it again. And to all of that we say, thank you, Lord. Next one. Short one. Psalm 107, verse 1. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever forever. We know his love endured yesterday because we experienced it. We know his love endures today because we woke up this morning and we experienced it. It will happen tomorrow and the next day and the next day and the next day. And when Jesus comes and we're caught up to meet him in the air, it will go on and on and on. He will establish his kingdom. It will go on and on. He will, he will, he will rule in righteousness. It will go on and on. His love endures forever. And God's people said, 
thank you, Lord. Romans 1, 18 to 21. Now, this sounds a bit negative as you read through this. Uh, this is all about what, we, what people miss. But there's thanksgiving in the midst of it, so let's read it. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness, since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified Him as God nor gave thanks to Him. Let me give you an illustration. I was preaching in a high river, high river, Alberta, one time. I arrived on a Saturday evening and stayed at a little motel, and the pastor of the church I was speaking at Sunday morning came and picked me up, and it was about this time of the year, so there was snow on the mountains, and I hadn't seen the mountains because I came in after dark, and, and we came around the corner, and this pastor had been living in High River, Alberta for about 150 years. Right, so we came around the corner, and this, this flatlander from Chatham, Kent, saw the mountains. And my, uh, my heart went, whoa, and my voice went, praise be to God for his infinite blessings. And the pastor said, oh, where'd you read that? And I said, look at the mountains. He said, yeah. 150 years in High River, you get used to the mountains. They're like a pile of, 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 of uh, sugar beets as we drive down Bear Line. See them every year, sugar beets, mountains. But for a flatlander from Chatham Kent, this was a wow moment. Like, whoa, mountains, look at this. We can miss God, the God who created the mountains, who said mountains and mountains, who said oceans and oceans. Right? It's our God. And we can say, oh, cool, oceans. And most of the world does, don't they? Paul says in Romans 1, you miss it. Don't miss it. Do not miss it. We who are God's people ought to be the most thankful people for everything he's created and never lose the mystery of it. For in his creation, we see him. That's what Paul's saying. And God's people said, thank you, Lord. Next. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 57. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Many of you have turkey cooking, because I had an idea. But I thought, no, everybody will be having Thanksgiving dinner on Monday if I go ahead with this idea. My idea was, why don't we just have a sharing time and everyone who's had any kind of victory in their lives can stand up and tell us all about it and we'll have a victory party. And then I thought, uh, nah, we'd be there a long time. <laughs> wouldn't we? Wouldn't we be here a long time if you thought back on every time God has given you victory in your life in some way? Wouldn't we be here a long time? Paul writes, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And God's people said, thank you, Lord. And the last one, 2 Corinthians 2, 14. But thanks be to God who always leads us in triumphal procession in Christ and through us, oh, I love this phrase, spreads everywhere the fragrance of the knowledge of him. Thanksgiving dinner is all about fragrance, isn't it? Don't you just love it? Turkey and pumpkin pie and, and potatoes and squash casserole and turnips and all the stuff I love. It's all about scents. Now the fragrance is here. Listen to this. Thanks be to God who always leads us in triumphal procession in Christ and through us spreads everywhere the fragrance. He uses us 
so that they can get the fragrance of forgiveness and the fragrance of joy and the fragrance of peace and the fragrance of transformation and, and, and the fragrance of victory and the fragrance of his abiding presence that, that, that brings that wonderful sense of God's presence to this world. And we are to express thanks for that. So we say as God's people, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. So when is Thanksgiving appropriate? We'll jump to the last point here, guys. Craig Randall drives a garbage truck. I found a picture of it, actually, the very garbage truck. He, in Peabody, Massachusetts. In the garbage container one day, he noticed a Wendy's soft drink cup. Wendy's was having a kind of roll-up-the-rim thing going on in those days. He won a chicken sandwich the week before and noticed that nobody had rolled up the rim on the cup. So he rolled up the rim on the cup, expecting maybe a french fries or a soft drink. Instead, he rolled back the rim and peeled a sticker worth $200,000 towards the construction of a new home. Now, goes without saying, that that would be a wonderful reason for giving Thanksgiving, wouldn't it be? Out of the garbage. Out of the garbage. A reason for Thanksgiving. I felt a whole sermon coming on, but you won't get one. You can thank the Lord for that. <laughs> when do we thank the Lord? In the midst of, the, of all the good times, when, when life is going on and, and the, the fields are dry and you can get out and get your beans in? Of course. Thank God for that. But what happens if you're at the international plowing match the day after Wednesday, like I was? And I should have worn skates instead of rubber boots. And the world's skipping along and trying to stay on their two feet through all the mud at the plowing match. What do you do then? And much more seriously, what do you do when life is falling apart and someone you've just loved has passed into glory and you've just been given some bad news or your finances are in difficult straits? The Bible says to thank him at all times. We're going to end with three verses, and then we're going to go home and have dinner. Number one, we are to thank him at times of celebration. Nehemiah 12, verse 27. At the dedication of the wall of Jerusalem, the Levites were sought out from where they lived and were brought to Jerusalem to celebrate joyfully the dedication with songs of thanksgiving and with the music of cymbals, harps, and lyres. When life is good, thank Him. When your finances are strong, thank Him. When you have food on the table, thank Him. When you've been through a tough time and you've come out the other side and life is looking good again, thank Him. You think, well, that's obviously, that's obvious, Bob. No, it's not. God commanded his people as they're about to go into the promised land. When you enter the land that I've given you, and you live in the houses you have not built, and you eat of the crops you have not planted, do not forget the Lord your God who has brought you into this land. That's what he said. Because he knows that in our, in our, in our abundance, we too easily forget to thank the Lord for every good and perfect gift. I think the biggest challenge to the gospel in our country today is materialism. I really do. Got it too easy. But not as God's people. We never forget the source of, of every good thing that we have. So in your abundance, in the good times, when the celebration is right, thank the Lord. Number two. Philippians 4, verse 6. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, I love this, with thanksgiving, Present your request to God with thanksgiving in the midst of your prayer time. My prayer time is far from perfect. There have been far too often, and God upbraids me a little bit in this, when I pray my list and get off my knees and get on with my day, and God is trying to get my attention, but, 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 but. That's why Paul throws in thanksgiving here because what thanksgiving does is to get our, our, our prayer life off of just our list of needs and onto all the good things that God's given us. It changes our whole attitude in prayer. So when you're praying, 
make sure that you thank the Lord for every good and perfect thing. And then the, the things that are so weighing so heavily on you will all automatically already begin to not be so powerful in your life. With thanksgiving. Thirdly, in all circumstances. 1 Thessalonians 5.18, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. I want to end with a story. I have a friend, Brian. Brian uh, is an engineer uh, and actually now has a very, very important job in, in the state of Florida. Every single highway, bridge, overpass, everything that's built in the state of Florida now has to have his signature on that document. He is now the Deputy Secretary of Transportation for the state of Florida. But when Brian was young, Brian lost a job. And it was devastating because his kids and our kids are the same age. We've been friends forever. And he invited Wendy and me to a party in his backyard in Florida. We were living there at the time, in Florida, to have a party. And I said, you're having a party? You lost your job. He said, yeah, but I was reading in the Bible that it says, count it all joy when you face trials of every kind. So I'm having a count it all joy party. I've lost my job. We're going to celebrate. And I thought, I wish I had his faith. But we did. We had a count it all joy party. He lost his job. How many of you had a count it all joy party when you've lost your job? Brian's the only guy I know. He's my hero in the faith. Amazing. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will. And by the way, just after that, Brian got this job with the state of Florida, and three decades later, he's now the second highest guy in the state of Florida in the Department of Transportation. See, he got a plan, right? In all circumstances, would you thank the Lord? In the toughest ones, thank the Lord. In the challenges, and some of you are going through them right now, thank the Lord. So let's all together say those three words one more time. I'm going to say amen, then Chris is going to come and close the service. All right, let's say them one more time. In every circumstance, we say three words, thank you, Lord. Father, thank you for every good and perfect gift, for Jesus most of all. Touch our hearts. Make us people of thanksgiving. May we bring fragrance, the fragrance of Christ, into our world today. In Jesus' name, amen.